Great. Okay, so uh, we could get started. So sure. uh, the topic of this interview is generally uh, artificial intelligence and uh, sort of computational approach to studying the mind. Um, so I want to start with a very basic uh, question. So in David Marr's book, Vision, which you're very familiar with, he outlined a sort of general top-down approach to studying perception and cognition. And uh, this approach is equally applicable to AI, it's fair to say. Um, so at the beginning of AI, people were extremely optimistic about the field's progress, but uh, it hasn't turned out that way. Uh, not many of not everybody was optimistic, like right. not me. <laughs> sure, but I mean, I guess there's this famous story yeah. about Marvin Minsky thinking that Vision would be a summer project and so yeah. on. So my question is, why has it been so difficult? And just as a, as a contrast, if you ask neuroscientists, why is understanding the brain so difficult? They give you very um, intellectually unsatisfying answers, like the brain has billions of cells and we can't record from all of them, and so on, which don't really uh, explain. It's more the size of the circuit doesn't no. really... Uh, there's something to that. Okay. Uh, if you take a look at the progress of science, uh, you know, the sciences are kind of a continuum, but they're broken up into fields. Uh, the greatest progress is in the sciences that study the simplest systems. So it takes a physics, the greatest progress. But one of the reasons is that the physicists have an advantage that uh, no other branch of science has. Uh, if something gets too complicated, they hand it to someone else. So if a, like the chemists. If a couple of molecules too big, you give it to the chemists. Uh, the chemists, uh, for them, if a molecule gets too big or a system gets too big, you give it to the biologists. And if it gets too big to, for them, they give it to the psychologists. And finally, it ends up in the hands of the literary critics and so on. Right. And uh, so what the neuroscientists are saying is not completely false. However, it could be, and it has been argued, in my view, rather plausibly, the neuroscientists don't like it, that uh, uh, the neuroscience for the last couple hundred years has been on the wrong track. Uh, there's a fairly recent book by a uh, very good cognitive neuroscientist, Randy Gallistol and King, uh, arguing, in my view, plausibly, that the uh, neuroscience developed kind of enthrall to associationism and uh, related views of you know the, the way humans work and animals and humans and as a result they've been looking for things that have the properties of association in psychology like having plasticity and well like uh, strengthening synaptic connections sure. uh, Gallistol has been arguing for years that if you want to study the brain properly you should begin kind of like Marr by asking uh, what tasks is it performing so he's mostly interested in insects, but uh, so if you want to study, say, the, uh, the, the neurology of a, ants, you know, of an ant, let's say, you ask, what does the ant do? And it turns out the ants do pretty complicated things, like um, you know, path integration, for example. And um, if you look at bees, they, bee navigation and so on, it involves quite complicated computations involving position of the sun and so on and so forth. But in general, what he argues is that uh, you take a look at animal cognition, human too, uh, it's computational systems. So therefore you want to look for the units of computation. Well, so you think about a Turing machine, say simplest form of computation. You have to find units that have properties uh, like read, write, and address. That's the minimal computational unit. So you've got to look in the brain for those. Uh, you're never going to find them if you look for a, a strengthening of synaptic connections or you know, field properties and so on. So he says you've got to start by looking for what what's there and what's working. And you see that from essentially Mars' highest level. Right. But most neuroscientists do not sit down and describe the inputs and outputs to the problem that they're studying. They're more driven by... Uh, let's say, put a mouse in a learning task and record as many neurons as possible, or re ask if a gene X is required for the task, and so on. Yeah. These are the kinds of uh, statements that their experiments generate. That's right. Is that because that's really flawed? Uh, well, you know, you may get useful information from it, right. but if what's actually going on is some kind of 
computation involving computational units like this, you're not going to find them that way. It's kind of you know looking under the wrong lamppost sort of. Uh, it's it's a debate among. I, I don't think Gallistel's position is very widely accepted among neuroscientists, but I think it's not an implausible position, and it's basically in the spirit of Mars analysis. So when you're studying vision, he argues you first ask what kind of computational tasks is the visual system uh, carrying out, right. and then you look for an algorithm that might carry out those computations, and finally you search for mechanisms which uh, of the kind that would make the algorithm work. Right. Uh, otherwise, you may never find anything. It's, uh, there are many examples of this in the even in the hard sciences, but certainly in the soft sciences. You, pe people tend to study what you know how to study. I mean, that makes sense. You, you have certain experimental techniques, you have a certain level of understanding, you try to push the envelope, which is okay. I mean, it's not a, this is not a criticism that people do what you can do. On the other hand, it's worth thinking whether you're aiming in the right direction. And it could be that if you take the roughly Mar Gallistel point of view, which personally I'm sympathetic to, uh, you would look in different, you would work differently, you'd look for different kind of experiments.